Hello everyone, this is Warhawk Beyond 2040 and welcome to a very special edition of the movie review series and today we are going to be talking about Batman Under the Red Hood and we are joined once again by the one and only, the badass himself, Rex DeBoss11. Rex, great to have you here again, how are you doing? I am doing well. Hey guys, how's it going? Let's talk about Batman Under the Red Hood. All right, here we go. So, Batman Under the Red Hood came out in 2010, almost 12 years ago. So, we're going to have a little chat about how we first became aware of Batman Under the Red Hood, and we're going to get straight into talking about this epic DC animated movie. So, we'll start with you, Rex. How did you first become aware of Batman Under the Red Hood? Well, if I'm honest, it was. I was aware of this quite a while back. I think around about the time when I watched The Dark Knight Rises, maybe 2012, um, around that time there, I became aware of some of these newer Batman um, animated films, you know, stuff that was obviously after The Mask of the Phantasm. But this was one of them that I remember watching maybe 2013, 2014 through boredom, not really paying attention to it. But I did watch this again, maybe 2017, 2018. And this was one of the ones that have always stuck out to me, especially with the Red Hood character and his origin and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, it was more to do with just Batmania during the 2012 period of the Dark Knight Rises and trying to find as much Batman content as possible. First time I became aware of Batman Under the Red Hood, I was already familiar with the whole Death and the Family story arc, which is where this movie takes a lot of the inspiration from i already knew who the jason todd character was i knew he was robin and obviously i know who the red hood was due to you know the joker being the red hood and jason todd was a character that i always wanted to see in animation i mean he never appeared in batman the animated series they just did dick grayson he became nightwing and it just went straight to tim drake and i remember thinking to myself well hang on a minute where, what about the other guy in the middle? Well, where's Jason Todd? And Bruce Tim kept saying, oh, we didn't want to use Jason Todd because he's too dark for the show. And I thought, well, you don't really have to show that stuff, you know, the graphic stuff. And he was just a character that I really, really wanted to see. And I wasn't really sure if we'll ever get it. And then around the time they started doing what they call original DC animated movies, they announced that next uh, feature length movie we're going to do is under the red hood death in a family sort of thing i thought all oh, right here we go this is what we're finally going to get we're going to finally get the animated debut of jason todd and i thought if this is the only time we'll ever get to see that character this the times now and this was a very different batman film to mask of the phantasm and I remember watching it thinking to myself, this could have easily been R-rated because it had more of a anime sort of feel to it, like manga sort of feel to it. It was definitely taking the brutality of Mask of the Phantasm to the next level. And I bought it on DVD as soon as it came out. You know, it was just one of those things that I really wanted to see. And I don't think I had been this excited to see a Batman animated movie since Return of the Joker and Mask of the Phantasm. I thought this is something really good. I, I know going in it was going to be good. I just didn't realise how good it was going to be. And like you said, you know, the Red Hood being such a violent character, you need to do something like that in a movie. And, you know, I've said to you before in the last review that, you know, Under the Red Hood for me is in the top three Batman animated movies of all time. I would say Mask of the Phantasm is number one, of course. Return of the Joker is number two. And I would say Under the Red Hood is like number three, but it's very, very close. So what would you say for you? How would you rate it? I mean, I'd rate it pretty highly, to be honest. I still think that Mask of the Phantasm is the best because of watching it when I was younger, when I was yeah. more invested in the Batman animated series, etc., etc. It was around the time when The Killing Joke came out that I went yeah. back and watched 
some of the animated films because of the killing joke being an animated film maybe 2016 2017 so it all sort of fits in right for me like I knew and I was aware of Under the Red Hood along with obviously the uh, Return of the Joker those kind of animated films but I never really watched them until maybe later down the line when I tried to maybe around the time when the Arrow series and all that got a little bit suspicious if we've spoken about around 2015 2016 times that I really started to search for more DC stuff you know the films weren't exactly amazing the films that had come out previously to that I wasn't a huge fan of Man of Steel what of what people might have been a fan of you know I mean I wasn't a huge fan of that nor Batman versus Superman and I feel like maybe 2016 2017 2018 around that time I started to look more into the characters that I did like as in the Arrow and obviously Batman etc and this is where I started to come up with some of these um animated films and obviously they don't like I said they'd always been in my you know mind and I knew that they existed but it was weird I think it was more the downfall of some of the CW shows that made me become more of a fan of some of the bigger characters like Batman and Superman because I had missed out on some of the um let's just say you know Superman Returns is something that I completely missed out on up until Man of Steel. I didn't know anything of Superman. And Batman, yeah. obviously, after The Dark Knight Rises, because he was kind of phased out of the DC universe for a small amount of time, it felt a little bit like, you know, I needed to rekindle whatever experiences I had with Batman. And Under the Red Hood at the time was a perfect, it was standalone, it was different, it was darker, it was more of what I wanted Batman to be. Obviously, in my mid 20s at the time, I felt. You know, I didn't want to watch cartoons that were based on cartoon characters that were obviously being hindered because of the PG or the, you know, universal rating or whatever. I wanted to see a Batman that was more based in. And, I, you know, I agree with you. I'm surprised that this is not an R-rated movie. This, I mean, I presume it's a 15, but I, I you know, it surprises me that this is not an 18. I believe it was a 15. I mean, the one I've got hasn't got a certificate. It's just like... um. It was a US copy I got. I bought like a special double disc edition. Like you had the movie on the disc one, and then disc two was like all the documentary about the, the Red Hood character and Jason Todd and other stuff as well to do with the movie. And we've got a very interesting cast here. We don't actually have Kevin Conroy and Mark Hamill in this movie, but doesn't take away from the performances here. So we've got. Bruce Greenwood, who does a superb job as the voice of Bruce Wayne and Batman. We got Neil Patrick Harris, who essentially he's more of a comedian. And here he does a, an amazing job here as Dick Grayson slash Nightwing. He was we, the voice that I recognised straight away. I recognised, obviously, um, uh, what's his name? Doogie Hauser. Yeah. <laughs> straight away, I didn't recognise his voice. He does I'm a like, really good I job. I recognise his voice here. And then I and, listened to him and I was like, that's Barney from How I Met Your Mother. That's Neil Patrick yeah. Harris. And we've got Joe DiMaggio as the Joker, who really and truly, he does an excellent job as the Joker. Now, he does sound a bit like Mark Hamill at times, but he doesn't try to copy Mark Hamill. He really brings something of his own to the Joker character. He does a superb job. Yeah, and I think of course, they, both just, they both are so good at the character. I think they both just sound like the Joker. Yes, and you know, that's where you're going to notice the similarities. When I'm listening to Joe DiMaggio's voice, I can tell that he's not Mark Hamill. But no. at the same time, I'm not rolling my eyes like I have done with some of the other, even across the both DC and Marvel. There's times when they've changed the actual voice. Like when I hear some of the Spider-Man voices of the cartoons later down the line, and it's not the original animated Spider-Man guy that I can't remember what his name is now. I think his name's it's Christopher Daniel or something. Yeah, when 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 I do, when it's not him. It's still, still, I hear his voice when I think of Spider Man. Same. Especially in the cartoons. And last but not surely least, we've got Jensen Eccles, who does the voice of Jason Todd slash Red Hood. And for those of you who know that name, he is the star of Supernatural. Hey, now that, that rings a bell now. That rings yeah. a bell now. Now, all due respect to everybody in the cast, they did a great job, but Jensen Eccles absolutely kicked ass in this movie makes, makes sense as well that supernatural a cw program at the time um and the lead one of the leading people in that program would have then been asked to have done some of this um dc work especially when this would have been created around the time that they yes. were starting to build the dc eu or you know television universe or whatever they call it around His... that time with arrow and then the flash and all that 
and Supernatural obviously wasn't part of the DC universe, but you know, if it was on the CW network, as far as I was aware, so you know, yeah. it, it makes sense that they use some of the actors that they already had. His voice to me, when I think of the Red Hood, or if I'm reading a Red Hood comic book, or I'm reading a Batman comic book with the Red Hood, I just hear Jensen Ackley's voice. He is what Kevin Conroy is to Batman. That's Jensen Ackles for the Red Hood. He just absolutely stole the show in this one. He was just absolutely incredible. And everything about his voice as the Red Hood just was so spot on. This is like everything he said, all the threats he made. You, you know, you really were scared of this guy. So I would not want to mess with this guy. It's like Batman scary, but Jensen Ackles as the Red Hood He's just downright frightening. And I think he absolutely owned this movie, I think. He was just absolutely incredible. What what would you rate his performance voice acting wise? I'd say it was definitely a nine out of ten. Like there were times when I think that he may have overdone it, but I think he was deliberately overdoing it. Yeah. Because okay. just even going back to what you said before about this character not being, let's say, film friendly. It makes no sense that we got given a 15 rating for the recent Batman film, and these are the characters that we can't have in it. I know. Yeah, you may true. as well just put this character in that story, yeah, or change the story. Like, the reason why, deeply, the reason why they didn't want Deathstroke is because they know what Deathstroke's background is, and they know that he is technically just like Jason um, Todd and the Red Hood. is a vigilante of his own right, who is a mercenary sort of gun for hire, not exactly a good guy, but not exactly, not technically a bad guy. He just goes after people, you know, like, like I've stated before. Sometimes people do good things for bad reasons. and Sometimes people do bad things for good reasons. Um, you know, Deathstroke would have been the perfect 15 rated character to have in a movie like that. Absolutely. Because it, it just seems like he just don't give a, he doesn't, he just doesn't give a damn. And he would hurt himself and hurt everybody around him to get at Batman and whatever else like that. But I suppose in the end, it comes down to they really wanted that film to be a PG rating, whether it got screwed up in England or not. I think they just wanted that film as they would want with any Batman film because of obviously toys and stuff like that. They want it to be a PG rating. Now, before we get into the movie, talking about it wise, the Red Hood's character or the version of Jason Todd days was first hinted at in the Hush graphic novel back in 2000. Two, I believe, and they did a thing where, you know, by that point, Jason Todd had been dead for about fifteen years or so in the comics, and they hinted at his arrival, where Clayface took on the form of Jason Todd, and he was wearing the Hush attire, and he kidnapped Tim Drake. Now, obviously, this doesn't happen in the movie, which we are gonna we'll get into, but this was the first time they actually hinted at the return of Jason Todd as. Clayface pretended to be Jason Todd in Hush attire, kidnaps Tim Drake and tries to kill him in an open grave. Very phantasm like. So that was where the idea came from to do an animated movie based around, you know, the death of the family story arc and the return of Jason Todd as the Red Hood. All of that, minus the Clayface stuff, most of that is included in this movie, with the exception of no Tim Drake appearance. Or Clayface, but I think most of what they did here, they did very well. But we're going to get straight into it now. So here goes. We are going to start talking about Batman under the Red Hood. So we start off with the death in the family scenario where we see Jason Todd is kidnapped and we see Batman is on his motorcycle. This was a really good opening for. A Batman movie what was your thoughts on this I thought this was great I thought this was direct to the point Joker ramped up no comedy in this first segment apart from the insane side of the comedy like no basically one of those I'm gonna beat you up and I'm gonna beat you up some more and then I'm probably gonna kill you but at the end of the day I'm gonna make it seem like I'm having fun while I'm doing it the more insane side to the Joker you get an introduction yes. immediately into this isn't going to be a guy tied up above a boiling pot of acid or whatever, and there's always the chance that Batman can save him. This was just literally, no, you shouldn't have got caught. I'm going to beat you to death. You know what I mean? Simple as. Yeah. 
I, I think it's portrayed a little bit like he didn't mean to kill him. No. When, once you're whacking and, you know, you, the, you see the feet, I, I, it shows um, Robin's feet, like, you know, like, just the way that it's portrayed, this is clearly going to be a scene that someone's probably not going to come back from in the same mind, even if he does survive. He's going to either be wheelchaired or, you know, brain dead or whatever like that. This is clearly a message that Joker wants to be sent here. Very dark very deep but very straight to the point they don't mess around it off now the interesting thing about this opening is in the graphic novel death in the family obviously this scene takes a lot of inspiration from that but in the graphic novel jason todd obviously he still gets butchered to death with the uh, crowbar and he gets blown to bits which we'll get into in a moment but it was because of a lady pretending to be Jason Todd's mum, hired by the Joker, who basically sets up Jason Todd to be trapped in the warehouse. And I think they could have probably included that in this scene, but really and truly, I don't think it would have added much to the story. Remember, remember in spoiler alert, it's not the case that he is killed or we think he's been killed and then he comes back to life and all that kind of stuff where he's managed to survive. No, this character is definitely killed in this scene. Yes. What happened is, and the reason why I think it's all pitched in, that the person who set this scene up was, of course, Rachel Gould. And we do get a little cutaway to Rachel Gould when he realises what he's actually done. Like, less of that and more of Rachel Gould knew exactly what jo uh, Joker was capable of doing. And, you know, he just, I reckon, in his own world, he wanted to test to see if Joker had this ability. Whereas, you know, that also leads to the explanation that anyone would have in a situation like this. Well, how the hell does he come back to life then? We, yeah. we we obviously get this explanation like obviously a lot of people may have not been able to have pinpointed those two things i don't really know how they happen in the comic book or in the novel but um obviously here you get to see that this kid is killed and then later down the line we get an explanation as to how not he didn't survive how he managed to come back to life because that is literally what it is rather than it being a somehow off screen he manages to jump out of the window and survive this explosion no he no. definitely dies in this scene. No, this was a definitely, for me, as far as DC animation is concerned, this was definitely the most darkest and most brutal way to start a Batman movie because I remember watching this, you know, you see Batman speeding on his motorcycle. You think Batman's going to get there. He's going to save Robin. But like you say, you know he's not going to get there in time. And um, even when you pans back to Ray Shogul, they said, oh, the, the boy won't make it and Ray go we can see him standing up, oh crap what, if, what have I done you know and comic book films no matter how corny do not shy away from those tied up above fires and James Bond scenes with lasers no. and stuff those scenes are designed to be used as a law to get Batman to come out in this scene Joker has got no intention of luring Batman out he just wants to cause some damage that's what I got from it he wants to just get a job done like whereas you've seen joker in some of the scenes in the films and in the cartoons where he'll act like a buffoon at the same time as not actually doing anything violent or anything like that it's more just annoying batman no yeah. this scene here is designed to really uh, hurt and cause damage to the people that are involved with the character of robin yeah and not just that jokers as you say he's not playing around there's no or should i or should i call him the boy blunder <laughs> because i swear that he was calling him the boy blunder from the start of this unless i just picked up on that yeah later. he did there was um sure he's calling a, him the boy blunder yeah there was a bit where um he's beating the tar out of him with a crowbar and um he goes i can't hear you lamb chub can you say it a bit louder you might have a punctured lung and then you see jason just spit in his face it's all blood and and joker just sort of slaps him and says well that's not nice the yeah, first apart, Robin had some manners. Apart from, and here we have our first issue, the fact that he gets beaten up, beaten almost to death with the crowbar, he clearly shots to the head, but he isn't bleeding at all, like, apart from in his mouth, but he's covered, yeah, in, he had, blood, um, he's covered in blood. Like, were we not allowed to show, like, cuts and gashes and things like that in this? Like, what? what's going on? Like, I know. His mask is broken, but he's not cut in any way. I, and I know it sounds like I'm going down the road of this being negative. No, I'm 
overall positive about this film. But that was the one thing, obviously, because it being in the opening scene, I was kind of just like, well, where's he bleeding from then? The mouth. All that blood couldn't have come out the mouth because he would be literally convulsing and dying then. And and maybe that's what you're supposed to take from this. But I didn't I didn't really think he was in major danger until you obviously heard the bomb counting down and then he realizes there's an explosion gonna go off. Yeah, in the graphic novel, um Jason Todd it's a lot more graphic where he gets beaten oh, to yeah. death a lot more. You you basically see from head to toe, it's like someone just got a bucket of blood and just poured it all over his body. That's yeah, how... that's what I'd imagine. I had to use my that's how it was in the graphic novel. Of I had to use my suspension of disbelief because even yeah, when was... Batman picks him up at the end of the scene to carry him away from the scene, my mind is still telling me why is this human being in one piece? Batman he should have found pieces novel. of his cape, pieces of his cape, pieces of his body scattered all across the the the, the, the vicinity of that explosion. But of course, they still tried to keep it. Like you yeah. said, they must have been trying to get a 15 rating for this and keep it less than an 18 disfiguring dismemberment of an actual human character. Yeah, the, um, the, at the end of um, the graphic novel, which is kind of like the same way this opening scene ends, in the graphic novel at the end when Batman picks up Jason Todd's body, it's a lot more horrific. It's just basically like a, just just not what's left of him really it's, it's quite horrific but yeah that's obviously... what i mean I, I i had to suspend my dis my disbelief yeah i had to say just imagine that this is a part of this child that has been blown to pieces yeah and you know whatever else you whatever they're showing you now which is a what looks like just a dead body yeah like maybe he's covering up the big hole in his body or whatever we don't know yeah but what we have to just take his word for it in this scene do you know what i mean like that it, yeah just suspend your disbelief and imagine what would have happened if he would have actually been exploded in that room when um batman picked up jason todd's body in the movie after the building got blown up you could definitely hear i know that he wasn't trying to copy kevin cornroy's voice but you could actually hear bruce greenwood's voice sounding like cornroy when he says jason you know i thought that was very very subtle but i thought wow if i close my eye there for a second it actually sounded like kevin cornroy and um yeah, it was very, very horrific. I thought, right, this is the best opening I've seen for a Batman animated movie, but this is far from what Mask of the Phantasm was. This is definitely taking that brutality to like the next level. And the soundtrack to this, when we get into like the opening credits, the music is a lot different to Mask of the Phantasm, because with Mask of the Phantasm, it's very loud, very epic, for almost like this choral, like orchestral. climate theme. It was, like, it was like orchestral. They still stuck with that traditional Batman sound. You know, traditional orchestral, and they took a lot of inspiration. You remember? Let's not even joke. The Batman animated series to this day has still got the best Batman theme, in my opinion. Absolutely. Like, the way that that theme builds up. It, I, that's the theme that I think of when I think of Batman. I can, still, I can hear it right now. Yeah. Same, yeah. You know, just them. <laughs> That like like the sound of like the with the yeah. orchestral as the instruments just meet each other, clash, yeah. bang, boom, psh, pow. That the that's what you get without the words with the Batman theme. If you think about it in the animated series, it literally is. It builds up, do, 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 boom, Batman hits somebody with a punch, and it, that's where you get the pow and the clash and the bang. But you don't, obviously don't see that like you do in the nineteen sixty six no uh, series. It's what your mind is supposed to be telling you, like the oomph and the crack of the punch, the snap, the, the you know, when he's moving around, he's flying around over it. Because some people say Batman can't fly. He uses his batarang, doesn't he? And his grappling hook and that to move around places. Yeah, like you get to see all these. He drops, Batman drops from insane heights and stuff like that, uses the cape to be able to control his fall. Once you see all these scenes put together with a load of orchestral music, it just gives it that vibe. But in this film, I think that they, it's still got the slight orchestral vibe to it, but it's more controlled. Yeah, the theme oh. that they used in the opening credits, it's very, very low. Yeah. It's almost got this ominous feel to it, because like you say, Robin's just died. You know, there's not going to be any grand, you know, for not, how shall I put it, like, epic grand theme, like, oh yeah, this is a Batman film, this is going to be good. No, you're meant to feel sadness, you're meant to feel morning you thought right exactly you're not you're not supposed to feel that animated series vibe of oh rub no. your fingers together oh rub your hands together this is going to be a great episode of batman or no. this is going to be a great 
you need to feel what we've just seen there. Even even like I said, when it, the scene ends, skip forward five years, etc. Yes, you do get that, which is a bit of an annoying thing for me. I'd like to see what the aftermath of the actual death of the Red Hood would have been. But nonetheless, we're in we're in an animated film here, so yeah, yeah. they've skipped forward a little bit. Yes. But yeah, like you say, the the build up to all of that is this really dark scene at the start of the film, almost like it's part of a separate film. Yeah, it's like easily. it's part of like a previously on Batman, if you know what yeah. I mean. Like it was like it was that. Like if if this would have started off from the Red Hood, like from five years later, where the Red Hood then comes back, etc. And then later in the series or later in the program, you would have uh, in the film, you would have got a flashback scene to what really happened to a thing. You wouldn't have this scene with the Joker could have been put in any part of this film apart from right towards the end. It could have been put in the start, the middle, anywhere near there. And it would have still made sense. This scene just fit the whole narrative. But it actually was a little bit felt like it was out of the movie, if you know what I mean. Like it didn't actually wasn't actually part of this movie. They deliberately filmed this scene in a much darker situation to make it seem right that's what we're going into now we've got to do all of the batman stuff now that's how i felt anyway it felt like yeah, i definitely got that it was it wasn't this situation of oh what's batman gonna do now it's like what can batman do now yeah <laughs> you know what i mean like, like they, they, where does they, he they, go they, from here yeah exactly there's a this guy isn't superman he isn't spider-man he hasn't got powers and stuff like that like this is just batman yeah and i'm not saying that he can't deal with this job i'm saying we haven't yet experienced this Batman dealing with death. Spider-Man did with his uncle. Yes. Superman has, yeah, with the death of his planet and all learning all this thing about his real parents. Batman went through the parents thing, but now we're getting this second level of, oh, right. So Batman's now got to deal with this now. How does Batman deal with losing somebody as Batman? Not Bruce Wayne when he was 10, when he was 12. How does Batman deal with losing someone? Because Robin's not technically bruce wayne or anything like that he's he's to do with batman batman lost his psychic yes. robin and Br bruce wayne and dick grayson they're not exactly friends as we've always seen they're more just agreement of working together like father son sort of relationship or you know like stepfather son sort of relationship like what alfred's got with batman it's less of a you know friendship and more of just like a, a commitment if you look at, it at this stage yeah like so when you look at that, it's like, how does Batman, not Bruce Wayne, how does Batman deal with losing a character? This hero that's supposed to save people, that's supposed to do this, who has led this child into this situation where this child's being killed. How does Batman deal with this? That's the question that we've been given here. We've been given immediately. And I think that's why they do immediately go into almost like a separate episode of the animated series or some form of what batman's animated series was in 2011 where we get this scene with him and nightwing later on so you get the dick grayson i keep saying dick grayson but i obviously i know that this is jason todd version version of robin but it stands for itself doesn't it robin and batman are more of a partnership of convenience than a yes. partnership of of like you know people see it as a father-son link but it's 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 a strained father-son link isn't it regardless of which one of these kids played robin it's never truly been a i love you you love me let's work together it's more of a you're frustrated i'm a frustrated man you're a frustrated boy i want to channel your talents and your ability to help me to stop things like that from ever happening again that doesn't sound like friendship to me warhawk that sounds like an agreement yeah i yeah, definitely got that maybe they developed that friendship over the time and that father-son image but as we've seen with some of the other things that like even we spoke about with the peacemaker father-son things like peacemaker struggling to deal with the fact that yes his father tra trained him brought him up raised him but he's also corrupted him there's an element with the batman character that he is actually corrupting this little boy this kid what, what, what we we see things in this film where it shows that these guys these boys they're 10 11 years old when they first come to batman now, i'm not trying to say it's anything perverted because it's obviously not but it's no. more like how comfortable is batman deep down using these 12 13 year old boys to do his dirty work for him <laughs> no he wasn't no. capable of doing this when he was 12 years old. No. Which is why we know the Batman origin. I know that I'm going a little bit off topic with that, but it is, in my mind, it does make me think as well, like, you need, you need to be able to understand the Bruce Wayne differences between Bruce Wayne and Batman, like Clark Kent and Superman. Yes. Like Peter Parker and Spider-Man. 
You need to be able to understand the two differences. This isn't Bruce Wayne's loss. This is Batman's loss. This is the first time we've truly seen the image of people who get close to Batman get killed. Because if you look at the origin of story and the length of story, this happened before some of the stuff that we then know. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And definitely. some of the stuff that we know, this happened before that. And obviously, this is probably why this storyline hasn't been brought into the mainstream of Batman because it is quite difficult to explain. Well, there's technically been more than one Robin. It's not just Dick Grayson. It's very mm-hmm. difficult to be able to portray these things, you know, to the audience that's watching, even though in this here, they clearly portray it as in, they want you to know that Dick Grayson as Nightwing is not Robin and Jason Todd as the um, Red Hood is not Robin. Robin's character at this stage in the Batman arc is dead Absolutely. from every angle. And the funny thing what you say, you made a very good point. This could have easily been two movies. I mean, we did have Death in the Family Blu-ray that came out years after this, but that was more like an interactive sort of thing where you get to choose how Jason Todd dies or gets to live and you play out his fates differently but definitely this easily could have been two movies and at times when you watch the opening of Jason Todd dying and then it skips fast forward five years later it definitely feels like two separate movies or like you say two episodes like that like Jason Todd dying at the end could have been like the season finale to like maybe a season three of Batman the animated series if it continued in another feels that form those scenes, feels that those scenes could have been taken from the animated series and thus then blended into the next few scenes that are the actual movie that they've created here. Like it feels like they might have taken the death of Jason Todd and then taken the next scene with Nightwing and Batman working together, reluctantly, but working together. That yeah. look at it, Nightwing, because obviously we're going to go into this next scene now. When Nightwing first comes into this next scene, it's like, you know, do you need help? And Batman's like, no. Yeah. Very sternly, <laughs> no. no. Yeah, this no. um this scene here, uh, as uh, Rex is alluding to, this picks up five years later after Jason Todd's death, and Batman and Nightwing come face to face with a villain called Amazo. Now I've got to say this before we get into it. I'm sorry, but Amazo just looked like a Mortal Kombat villain. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just had to get that out of the way. He just looks some like a Mortal kind of Kombat guru, villain. Some kind of guru. Some kind of guru. Yeah. Incredible. In some kind of Goru Incredible Hulk sort of yeah. hybrid. Like I've seen this kind of character in um in Agents of Shield. There was a character called Lash. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, think I remember that, that. It, it immediately reminded me of a character like that. Some and I've heard good things about the Amazo character. And I think that's why I said what I said in such a long form rant before about the whole they almost forced this Batman and Nightwing scene just to show you, oh yeah, the Robin that died, by the way, that's not Dick Grayson. No. They almost like they needed to let you know at the start of this scene. Oh, just for those people that are upset, that's not Robin Dick Grayson, the one that we've always known. This is a almost like it's like an expendable uh, uh, version of Robin. Absolutely, yeah. And um, I love the design for Night Wings. Very similar to the Batman the animated series, but um, obviously it is slightly different because. Uh, Nightwing's costume in the animated series was just pure black with a little blue bird um, emblem on his chest. But here he's got very short hair and he's got blue and black, like blue boots, blue armbands. I like this design for Nightwing. And Neil Patrick Harris is just awesome doing the voice of um, Nightwing. But yeah, as you say, like Batman and Nightwing here, they're just like reluctantly working together because Nightwing's like, oh, let me help you out. And Batman's like, no. He don't even give any exposition expedition or anything. He just literally says no. <laughs> he just says no, no, very deep, like no. I as in very sternly, I don't need your help. Yeah, definitely. and I think that's more to do with he doesn't want um, he doesn't want any of the people that he's been linked to once again being mm-hmm. being hurt or being thing. And like I said, because five years later, Batman has just then had five years to absorb the fact that. And this is why he hasn't got a new Robin at this stage. And he doesn't yeah. want any help from Nightwing. It's because he obviously got to the stage now. It's like, right, this is not working. This sidekick business is not working. I'm sure the comic books and some of the other novels and things uh, actually show some of this where Batman is struggling, where he knows he needs help from somebody, but he can't get help from. In fact, this might actually be one of the reasons why they start, started in the comics to put Batman with the other superheroes 
because they realised, obviously, we can't just keep out matching Batman in these comic book situations and he hasn't got any help. And obviously, he's still struggling to deal with the loss of certain things. Obviously, even he struggled in the comic books to deal with Dick wanting to move on and say, no, I, I don't want to be your psychic anymore. Why? Why do I need to be your psychic anymore? And obviously, yeah, exactly. a lot of that was to do with Batman struggling, wanting to be able to control certain narratives with Dick. And obviously, I, I, need, to, I need to change that because that does not... <laughs> <laughs> that does not sound like a great statement about Batman. But yeah, you know what I mean about the whole Batman. Yeah, yeah, of course. Especially with the, the, the Dick Grayson character, there was always tension between Batman and Robin. Always. Now, obviously, they defeat Amazo, and this was quite horrific the way they defeated Amazo. And you see, um, obviously, Amazo's a machine, so we see Amazo get blown to bits, his head goes flying off. And around this time, we get the introduction to the Red Hood, where we see him meeting with some of Gotham's most notorious drug dealers and gangsters. This, to me, I would say is the most iconic Red Hood scene I can re ever recall, because you see Red Hood appear. He's basically telling these criminals, you do as I say or you're dead. You know, no beating around the bush. You know, he doesn't like drag out his threats. And that's what I like about the Red Hood character. He doesn't waste any time. There's no big grand speech. Goes like, look, I'll protect you from Batman. But if you cross me, you're dead. And obviously um, he uh, chops off the heads of these other criminals. And you don't actually see the heads, but you clearly get an indication as to what the Red Hood's done. Oh. It's the whole gangster in the grave scene, what we've seen in the Mask of the Phantasm. Yes. Like they look into that. We don't we get to see their reaction and not what's in the grave. But it's no. enough sort of hint to know this is disgusting. But yeah. I will say, one thing I like about the Red Hood character is he is clearly an amalgamation of the Joker and Batman. That's the whole point. The erraticness of the Joker, but he's also got the straight up confidence to walk in a room and know that everybody in that room won't immediately take any risks. But even if they do start shooting shots at him, he's confident that he's not going to die in that room. That is exactly. that whole Batman nature. Whereas with the Joker, it's the sick, sadistic. So we get both sides of it. We see immediately this Red Hood character is not a good guy. He's not necessarily a bad guy. He's clearly trying to control all the bad guys so that they all work for him. There's something more going off here. So even if you're not aware that the Red Hood is, you know, Jason Todd, you still get in the vibe of, hmm, this is interesting because this guy is doing a lot of crazy stuff, but he's doing it to bad people. Like I said, sometimes people do bad things for good reasons. Sometimes people do bad, uh, good things for bad reasons. And Jason Todd here is clearly going after the bad people of Gotham and utilizing what they do with drugs and whatever else to make money, trying to control their, their narrative so that then he can then use that, that money to do whatever he needs to do, which is probably take on the Joker. Yes. Now... Another villain who's introduced here. Now, he's not really the main villain. He's more like on the side, and that's Black Mask. And we learn that all these criminals are all working for Black Mask. And Black Mask is kind of like caught up in this, I wouldn't like to say war, but it's more like this game of one-upsmanship with Batman and the Red Hood. What was your thoughts on Black Mask's role in this movie? Way too comedic. I'll say that way too comedic. Bit, yeah. Especially in a film with the Joker. I felt like his I felt like the use of Black Mask was just unnecessary. Yeah. Like yeah, I know what you I mean. Like to add to add just to add him in as the villain that people are working for and you know, to tie in the fact that Batman and then obviously the Red Hood are probably gonna end up going after the same guy. So it's sort of a you know, whose side is he on situation? How many times do I have to say that in these reviews? Whose side is he on situation, which is the classic comic book situation, of course, of the villain versus vigilante versus uh, anti-hero sort of situation that you get a lot in the DC universe. As I always keep saying, these are not necessarily superheroes. No. I mean, like we, we I don't know if we're labeling Batman as a superhero at this stage. This Batman is more the Dark Knight, isn't he? Like, we're talking not very loved by society but still keeps trying to save the day to make sure that yeah. the real real sadistic and horrible uh, members of society don't manage to you know get a grip on gotham or you know the surrounding 
area of whatever, because obviously most of this is just centered around Gotham. You don't really get Batman doing anything anywhere else. No, you know, you don't really. So after um, Red Hood has more or less taken the, the whole um, mob by force, we see um, Batman chase after the Red Hood. And this brings Batman to a very familiar place, the Ace Chemical Plants. Now, we all remember why Batman remembers the Ace Chemical Plant, because this is where um, the Joker was first created. And we hear um, the Red Hood more or less taunting Batman, said, oh, yeah, memories, hey? This was the first sight of your first failure. What was your um, thoughts on the way they incorporated Joker's origin in this little mini flashback? Well, my first kind of thing was I was concerned with was the fact that how did Jason Todd know about this? Robin wasn't even around when Robin, the original Robin, wasn't even around when the Joker was created. So no, years before. I, I, I would like to know how Jason Todd was even savvy to this flashback scene. <laughs> like, it might, yeah, have, no. yeah, it might have been common knowledge in the underground world that it was Batman who created the Joker. Yeah, that would it would have been nice to have had some kind of, you know, actual thing to it. But the way that they played this off was like Jason was there the whole time, bearing on mind that they actually showed Batman pushing the Red Hood into or the red hood tripping and falling into the pot of acid and batman attempting to save him batman never pushed him he clearly they didn't show any of that and he didn't push the joker the joker wasn't the joke character until this he was playing the red hood wasn't he the original like mysterio style version of the red hood yeah with the, yeah, more... the um original origin of the joker was he was a failed comedian who was more or less duped into donning the Red Hood attire, which which is the original Red Hood attire back in the uh, 50s comics. Obviously, The Killing Joke retold that story. And the way um, he becomes the Joker, as you see in the flashback, was Batman is trying to stop the Red Hood because it's alluded to the fact that, as we saw in this movie, in this scene, where several criminals have used the Red Hood persona. So anyone could be the Red Hood, but everyone remembers that the first Red Hood was the Joker and this flashback scene here Batman doesn't try to save him he's trying to stop him and of course Joker was a bit of a fool before he became the psychotic clown we know is he tripped over on his own cape yeah, and the did. way it's shot it's like did Batman push him or did he throw him or did the Red Hood jump so it's really a way of how you look at it really uh, the scenes as well you're supposed to look into them as in their very similar scenes because what happens is Batman in the original scene with the Joker obviously has a chance to stop him, as in to actually just stop him. But what he does is he tries to capture him, yes. information or whatever, and this is where the Joker runs off, or the Red Hood, the original Red Hood, runs off, chips over his cape. Red Hood then does the same thing. If you watch it, he points the gun at Batman. He could kill him, but he doesn't kill him. He shoots the car, and then in the most ridiculous thing that I've seen in any extent of any programming, I watch Batman bounce off lava or acid it yeah just, no. he actually uses his grappling hook doesn't go into the water which his feet would have now if they'd have just showed the scene where his feet touched the acid and then when in the next scene his feet are all exposed where the rubber and that's all been exposed so he has to get out of the scene that would have been perfect for me but the fact that they actually showed him springboard off molten lava or whatever the hell's in those pits acid whatever <laughs> they showed him spring off them and there was absolutely no damage to his feet after yeah i know what you mean at least at least could have just shown a little burn mark on the on the boots at least so i we all watching this as a as, as a youngster or as a maybe as an unknown batman fan you wouldn't have noticed those things no but what i took from this was clearly jason todd doesn't want to kill batman could have killed him there even though, right, so you don't shoot Batman, which is, you know, to be truthful, now I'm actually thinking of it and I've had a few seconds to think about it. It's clever, isn't it? Batman's going to have bulletproof capes and armour and you're going to know all that stuff if you're the old Robin. Yes. Why waste a bullet on trying to shoot him in the protected area of his suit? He shot the car. I actually, you know what, that is actually a genius, a genius scene now. I'm taking back any negativity that I felt before about that scene, apart from the obviously springboarding off the lava. I just thought yeah. that was stupid. <laughs> I know. Sense now. Now we come to a really good scene here. We see Batman and Nightwing go to Arkham Asylum. 
where they go to meet the Joker to find out what he knows about the Red Hood. And um, what's interesting about this is, and I like this, that Joker doesn't have a normal cell like the other criminals in Arkham. He has a completely separate cell pretty much under the basement because he's so dangerous and you see him in his prison gear and he's all strapped up in his belts. I mean, heavily armed as well, like four or five, um, you know, prison officers armed <laughs> at his room and stuff. His room's clearly just, I mean, I don't know if we're supposed to see it as a padded room or if it was a concrete room. I think it's a concrete room. It's a concrete room. Yeah, that is way beneath, you know, the core of the earth. It pretty much near enough is. And I like the fact that Batman and Knights, when they enter Arkham, and they have to have like, a special passcode just to go into Joker's cell, because, you know, you're not taking any chances with this guy. I really like that. It really puts the Joker over that this is not your typical Batman villain. This isn't someone like the Riddler or someone like the Penguin. This is a real dangerous, dangerous yeah. person. I like the Joker, though. I like the Joker's character here. How I like how he... In turn, if if you look at it the way that it is, I like how the Joker is portrayed in this scene. Just because when I break it down, he's more evil, more menacing. You mm. can tell that they are trying to show you that this guy has done something that is unforgivable. Yes, absolutely. And I like um in this scene. I mean, to me, this is classic Joker. Batman and Nightwing are asking. He's calling himself the Red Hood. What do you know about him? And he just pretty much says, hmm, he's got horrible taste in clothes. When I wore that number, he had class. And uh, Nightwing just basically loses it and says to him, look, if we find out you're involved in this in any way, we'll know. And Joker's like, oh, you're no fun anymore. Look at you all grown up in your big boy pants. And then he just takes a dig at Batman about Jason. He says, well, well you know, better than his replacement hey batsy not much good when you're worm food huh and worm, just, yeah I was, I was just thinking then was it seafood or was it worm, worm food? food and just batman just loses it and i thought even the it. joker then he's like are you gonna really do it this time are you really <laughs> gonna do it this time like yeah, and we yeah. Can just he just like throws him halfway across the room it, it cuts to nightwing doesn't it and he's like bruce you know what i mean like what the hell are you doing he's like go on you gonna do it Huh? You gonna do it this also, time? Go back to the Batman and Robin thing. I think this was also a nice way of sort of reuniting the original Batman and Robin without having, you know, the character in the Robin suit. It was nice. Yeah. yeah I don't yeah, know yeah, how nice. long at this point that Robin hadn't, the original Robin hadn't been with Batman, but it was nice to obviously see that even like Alfred still looking after uh, Robin's stuff and all that. Yeah. And like you can still tell that weirdly enough and i think it's played well by neil patrick harris as well like robin sort of turns into or nightwing sort of turns back into robin doesn't it a little as bit soon yeah as, as soon as around as soon as he's around batman it almost feels like nightwing immediately goes back into the 17 16 year old boy that he was before when he's around batman and alfred because that's what he feels comfortable as well it's not even just that i mean got remember after dick grayson's parents were killed in the circus you know bruce and alfred pretty much raised him didn't they that's what i'm saying it's less of a friendship thing between batman and 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 and, and dick grayson and more of a agreement thing and that's where i think the whole premise of the robin character comes from it's never going to be any different is it it's never going to be batman having a son and then his son becomes robin it's always going to be there's a tortured young man out there that has gone through something similar to what you've gone through i think that we can help him out here that seems yeah. like the whole premise of the Robin character. Yeah, definitely. I definitely got that impression with um, their relationship. And um, you see, um, you see in the Batcave, you know, like even when he's getting his leg all stitched up. And unless Bruce gets really, really hurt, you won't see Alfred doing any of that for Bruce. It's been made fun, like visibly clear in the films and in the cartoons and comic books. Alfred almost Bruce begrudges Alfred for raising him yes like as in like i can do it myself leave me alone you know what i mean like whereas with robin's character you can clearly see that he actually probably misses that part of it of course of course he really respects him doesn't clearly, he? another thing that i'm thinking is you can always clearly see that robin's problem has never been with alfred it's no. always been with bruce yeah i think that goes for all the sidekicks really well they're both traumatized aren't they like, you've got to remember 
deep down, these are both traumatized children. So in the I look, let's see how Alfred sees Bruce and Dick Grayson. They're still 16 year old messed up children who went through horrible things and they're still learning to be able to control, which is one of the reasons, like I said, why he probably still calls Bruce Master Bruce is because he will always see him as that young 12, 13 year old angry as hell boy who can't get over the fact that his parents were murdered in the way. And obviously in our timeline, because of the way that his parents were murdered by the Joker, like, and he remembers the dance in the pale moonlight or whatever comment. You know, Batman is really traumatized by that in our version of Batman. So, you know, you have to look at it from there. Like, the whole Batman and Nightwing thing in this probably would have been a homage to, yeah, let's get the original team back together subtly. Yeah. Even though no one actually, like, uh, declares it, yeah, it's kind of like a little mini reunion of the original Batman and Robin team. So we come to the next scene where... Batman and Nightwing stop the Red Hood from hijacking Black Mask's next weapon and they chase him to a train station where we see him injures Nightwing, but he also um, detonates a bomb as well. And there's a cool bit here which gets touched upon more later on. We get the scene as well, don't forget, where we get the paranoid Black Mask, don't stare at him thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, God. The young intern guy, don't we? There's yeah. some new guy comes to work. I actually thought he was going to turn out to be one of the side characters or whatever, but he doesn't. He just turns out to be a random character. But we get the introduction of his character, the new intern guy, and he keeps staring at a black mask, even though he's been told by the other guy he doesn't like to stare at him. You get me? And then obviously, black mask, I think, turns around at the end of the scene, doesn't he? And says, you know, if you keep staring at me, and then he punches him anyway, I'm sure he did. I don't know if that's in this scene. Yeah, he did. He did. The first, we get the first hinkling that the black mask it's more for fear but he doesn't like to be stared at like he's not happy with the way that he looks you know what i mean it's not like the joker where joker's just in unhinged anyway it's more of the deal of this guy is crazy as hell but he's also very very unhinged at anyone staring at him looking at it the way that he looks you know pointing him out etc 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 although like i said we could do with less comedy in these types of scenes and more yeah. that mash of his dangerous you know incredibly dangerous side yeah i definitely agree yeah even though black mask was mostly a, a decent villain yeah he was they, he was definitely like played up I'm not really sure if they were trying to go for comedy but you could clearly see that he's kind of comedic but it just doesn't really fit the, the tone of this movie that's probably the only um takeaway i would probably have for this movie is that the black mask just didn't really need to be there and then of course at the end of that scene before we get the chase and um batman going after red hood there's the sort of scene that we need to mention about where uh, nightwing tries to stop the red hood in the helicopter but then sends the helicopter corroding towards uh the ground like and it obviously batman has to stop the helicopter showing yeah. of course that even though Nightwing is a very capable character who's got some nice weaponry himself. He still doesn't have the make sure that you save people at all cost, even if you hurt yourself. It's always the people first, the sort of code of ethics that Batman seems to have developed outside of the live action films. Of course, the no killing, etc., that we see outside of the live action films, apart from obviously maybe the recent one. Yeah, definitely. Just thought... before this as well, there is the and I think it needs to be mentioned, there's the high-rise building that's not yet fully built yet scene where they're chasing him and he explodes yeah. the gas tank or whatever he throws it, shoots it, explodes it on Batman, he's trying to get away. They chase him for a good two, three minutes of animation in this animated film. Like They chase him for ages and then he gets to the bit where he jumps onto the blimp, doesn't he? And he uh, manages to just like briefly sort of get away from Batman and thing, and that's where they chase him to the train station. But there is, I don't, I don't know if, if this is in your version or if it was just in my version, but there is a lengthy chase scene, something that you would never get in the animated series because they wouldn't have time to do this. Like you get that, and obviously, of course, you get the bit where Batman somehow filming the Red Hood through his vision. His, like his eyes, he's filming Red Hood, yeah? And then he goes to get him with the grapple hook, doesn't he? And then he cuts the grapple hook before it extends. Yeah. Which is obviously a trick 
that some people would know. And of course, one of those people who would know that, of course, is uh, is Nightwing. Yeah. Because of the high rise techniques and all that kind of stuff, he would know before the the wire, which we talk about that later on. But before, I just thought I'd mention that before we actually get to the exploding underground railway thing, there was a lengthy, lengthy chase scene. This chase scene was something straight out of you know a two thousand and six, seven, eight, nine, ten live action movie. They blatantly filmed this in the way of it being in the style of a live action movie. And then we got the exploding subway train comes. And he says, oh, you know, you haven't lost your touch. And there's obviously a bit more to it. But obviously, we'll find out that in the scene later on. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good scene. Yeah. Yeah, this was in um, my DVD as well. It's not really that much different. It's pretty much the same, really. It was a very good scene. It's like you say, this is something you would have definitely seen in like a, a live action movie from like 2006 to like 2010. Because this film did come out in 2010. So it kind of makes sense to have that kind of scene. And it was good, you know, seeing Batman and Nightwing going after this mysterious Red Hood. And I definitely got some vibes off um, Mask of the Phantasm with this scene. Obviously, there wasn't a chase scene as such in Mask of the Phantasm, but it definitely felt like something you would have seen in that movie, wouldn't you say? I think that's what Mask of the Phantasm maybe needed is the where we complained about the scene between uh, Batman and Phantasm last in like 20 seconds and then he gets attacked by the the officers it would have actually made a bit more of a suspenseful situation if that's even a word um, to have Batman chase the Phantasm for a minute and a half in the program multiple times where he can get near him he does things to get away or she does things to get away and then he stumbles up into the police yeah yeah because definitely. it would have built it a little bit better as in like drats or rats I can't catch the villain but now I've got a bigger problem, which is the people that are actually trying to catch me. Because that's always the problem with Batman, remember, is that he's not Superman. And even no. they've changed Superman a little bit in time, haven't they? Where they made normal people start to hate Superman a bit as well. Like, you know, who is this powered being who can then dictate to the rest of the world what we can and what we can't do? And even Batman, like you say, in the 2016 movie, he, or 2000 and whenever movie it was, Batman versus Superman, he has to actually go after Clark Kent and Bruce and, uh, and Superman and obviously to suggest how do we know we can trust you yeah, you know exactly. you're not you're not from this world you're the most powerful is being out there and I'm not too sure I'm comfortable with that uh, understandable so the next scene we get here they're back in the bat cave and um Bruce is like going over the audio footage with Nightwing and they point out to the scene where um Red Hood cuts the rope with the blade, and of course, uh, Nightwing points out that no one could, no one else could have known how to do that if they had proper training. This was actually a very good scene with Batman and Nightwing. You know, the two of them working together, even if and it's Al and Alfred, and Alfred involved in that scene as well. Yeah, that's, yeah, Alfred had a little bit in there as well. I thought it was quite. When we get leg bandage in, and uh, you can clearly see that Bruce is sitting in the seat, and Alfred's sensing this is the kind of thing that would have caused problems between Batman and Robin before because of course Nightwing's talking keeps speaking and he's like well I need I like to speak or he says something like that I like to talk part I like of my to charm. Yeah. <laughs> part of my charm and I yeah. think Alfred's just making sure that he's aware you know you know Master uh, Grayson this is possibly one of the reasons why you and Bruce fell out in the first place you know right now you're not Batman and Robin you are Bruce and and Dick Grayson, Bruce Wayne and Dick Grayson. So, you know, let's just try to keep this normal. And obviously that's where they then go into the scene where Batman then says, or Bruce then says to him, look, who do you know that can do this kind of stuff here? And obviously uh, it's Nightwing who talks about before the wire gets talked and like stretches out, he cuts the wire before it traps his ankle or anything like that before the grappling hook. That's something that somebody would have to know who and even like, but Bruce Batman says, who do you know that's got a strong enough blade to cut through my wires or my uh, lines? You know what I mean? Like who who yeah. would have a, a strong enough knife or blade to cut through them? Somebody who's aware that they exist. And that's yeah. when we get the next scene, which is, of course, a flashback. The most scene. Well, it's, we get the flashback scene. But then, of course, after we get the realization, don't we? But we'll talk about the flashback scene first. Now, this flashback scene here, I thought was quite cool because... You are essentially 
you're getting two flashbacks for the price of one as you was alluding to before we started this is like you see jason todd as a kid and you can see he's all happy he's excited you know the idea of being you know batman's sidekick and he's just having a blast and then you see the next scene jason todd's a lot older he's a lot more violent and he's a lot more bloodthirsty i thought this was very well done in animation this is something you would have seen in live action and i like the way they took that in this scene it's like you see jason todd as a kid he's all happy as he would be he's a kid and as he's got older he's become more bitter and more darker how did you think this scene went what was your thoughts on this the way they did it it's a very nice way of having the trajectory of his life going into um and sorry we do actually get the reveal of what he says to bruce or to batman before the flashback scene where it bruce takes the audio and highlights it and says he's like oh you haven't lost your touch zooms in again you haven't lost your touch mm. and then he zooms in again you haven't lost your touch bruce yeah so yeah. whoever the red hood is is clearly got knives that can cut through batman's um ropes and uh grappling hooks he's clearly got certain types of ability he's clearly got certain types of skill and he also yes. knows that batman is bruce wayne this That's is where nice. obviously we start to get the match in and i think this is where we immediately lead into the flashback scene of him thinking about jason when jason was younger yeah I, I thought this was very good cameo from the riddler yeah he looks just like frank gorshin from the 66 show the, the, the original riddler this guy is with the stick and the you know the riddler yeah. question mark golden stick or whatever that he's got the, this yeah, is the king without yeah. the hat he hasn't got the hat no he hasn't got the hat i realized that i noticed that mm, he didn't have his classic bowler hat it, 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 his thingies do his henchmen do yeah that's that's really weird you'd have thought the main guy would have his hats you know I, I, oh well <laughs> and if you watch this scene subtly what does uh robin do in this scene cuts the rope before yes. it gets and batman remembers this obviously of the young thing and then immediately once this scene's gone down we then cut into the older jason just not even remotely afraid guys are shooting uzis and shotguns at him and he just wipes the floor with all of them. His ability is way higher than the level hand to hand of Batman. He's way beyond the physical and, you know, thing. He's, in fact, to be perfectly honest, this Jason Todd is probably as close to anyone else being Batman. Even with the anger, it's almost like this guy would, be, would have been the perfect, like, person to carry on Bruce Wayne's legacy down the line, like a Batman yeah. Beyond, uh, you know, character. Like like Jason Todd yeah. would have been. Jason, just by looking at that scene where he just takes on them villains and they're shooting, this this ain't no hand to hand. I win a bit of a fist fight, take a few punches and then win. No, he goes in a room where there are armed guards, armed thugs, people trying to legitimately kill him. That shotgun blast, where that went to, I don't even, you know, I mean, I'm, I I can I just watch that in the background in, in now in in real time, and I'm telling you, I've got no idea where those shotgun pellets go. But Jason Todd is one hell. Of of an evasive superhero oh absolutely definitely i love the way they um showed you how much jason todd's evolved as a person you know happy-go-lucky boy excited to be there and be batman's partner to just being a uh, very bitter and dark and almost very violent and like you say you know this is what jason todd could have been like very, if he consumed, been by anger. very consumed by anger like you would have thought that this would have been more suited for the Robin character, the original Robin, because of what happened with his parents. But it's quite obvious that Jason Todd is a very messed up and angry young man. Yeah, we get to learn more about that later on in this movie. But um, yeah, this was a great scene. This was the flashback, you know, seeing how much Jason Todd has evolved. So we come to the next scene. We see a group of villains called the fearsome hand of four they lure out the red hood and try to trap him nearly overpower him and then we see batman would you say it kind of comes to his rescue in a way what would you say this was 
it's very much the Batman and Catwoman scene from The Dark Knight Rises. Yeah. Like, where she's like, she's saying, oh, I'm a woman or whatever. Like, I don't think they care. And then, you know, like, he drops down and helps. It's very much the scene like that, like, where I don't think it's quite the I'm coming to help you and rescue. I think it's just you're the lesser of the two evils, clearly. I'm going to try to at least address. And I suspect that you are my former sidekick. And if there's any part of that sidekick left inside of you, I want to be able to. Remember, Batman's Zavi, and he knows about all the Lazarus pits and that because he's done been with Rachel Ghoul before, obviously. So he knows oh. about all that stuff before. He knows how Rachel Ghoul is what it is, even though we later in the movie, spoiler alert, we get an actual explanation as into what Rachel Ghoul is. But, you know, when you look at it, the way that they explain this is, I think that Batman's going after unbeknownst. He, he, he knows that Jason must be dead and he knows deep down how this could have happened. But I think he's trying to hold on to any form of this being the real Jason and the, the Jason that he was before Joker killed him. Yeah, I definitely got that vibe, what you were saying. Like, well, I'm not here to help you. I'm just here to like basically even even the playing field, so to speak. Yeah, we also get a scene. I don't know if it was before. I think it was before that. We also got the scene, didn't we, where the black mask, I think, thugs start to take out the other gang members, don't they? Yeah, they start to do that. Because I'm and that's, the where, of the Red that's, Hood. Where, that's where the Red Hood gets into a situation with these. Before those more powered people come into it, um, I think, uh, you know, these guys are just henchmen, aren't they? Before yeah, the more or less. They're called the uh, the fearsome hand of four. The fearsome hand of four, yeah. One's got the they're basically a mimic of the turtles. <laughs> one of them's got one of them's got the two katanas, one of them's got um yeah. the uh Donatello stick, but it's like got like some kind of you know what they could have been though. Now that you mention that they could have been like Shredder's turtles. Yeah, like they, these would have been straight out of an alternative turtle movie they were mortal Kombat versions of the turtles so like you know yeah you're yeah. right they are they're foot clan versions of the turtles basically you Pretty know much. not shells anything like they're all in green or gray green sort of color one of them oh. actually has got cyclops power though like with the eyes but, oh yeah know, the blue two, eye i remember two, that. two yeah. of them are fresh out of the turtles with the two long katana swords and the uh stick that donatello uses but with they've got some kind of it's either just like glowing sticks, like Nightwing stick, Nightwing sticks, or they've either got some kind of special ability that they're like plas made of plasma or, you know, lightsaber or whatever the hell. But they they they're not just average weapons, are they? They clearly got some extra power going on with these weapons. Yeah, yeah, definitely got that vibe from that look they had. Definitely looked like something out of Ninja Turtles. They do get the better of Red Hood after a melee and a fight because it's four on one. And then that's yeah. when Batman turns up and makes it more of an even fight. And it's yeah. just like him and Red Hood are just like, shut up. And like, well, he just says to Red Hood, just shut up and fight. You know what I mean? Yeah, of course. Now, um, this next scene here we get is um, this was actually pretty good. You see Batman trying to like reach out to the Red Hood. The female, she cuts Jason. And that's yes. where Batman gets the sword and the blood on the sword. And then obviously we get to see Batman using obviously the next scene is batman i think in his lair isn't it and him using the sword what he finds on the sword yeah to to think obviously the jason todd thing ends up as a very, very mask of the phantasm uh, uh exit from jason here with the smoke in that way he throws the smoke grenade and then gets out of the scene I oh that yeah was, oh yeah i really forgot about that <laughs> well, that was pretty cool the way that jason leaves the scene but yeah because i've just literally watched it luckily i'm watching some of it in the background so i've just watched that and yeah we do get the where batman finds the sword at the end of the scene obviously after all the smoke clears he looks down on the floor and uh, they even give batman like a gas mask thing and everything to just cover himself in case anyone asks questions of how does he manage to survive the gas and then he sees the sword with the blood on it and that's where batman obviously takes that sword and uses that sword thing i think we get a flashback scene here as well don't we just yeah we do scene. get um yeah, we do get one here. This was actually quite good. We more or less learn about how Jason came back from the dead. And this was um this was quite interesting because in the graphic novel there was two um there was two ways that he he came back from the dead. The first one was Superman punched a hole through time and it rewrote the timeline, which was ridiculous. 
and then they reworked it to a more believable um to a more believable way to bring him back which was the lazarus pit and i thought the way they used the lazarus pit to essentially bring a dead person back i thought that was very very well done and what was your thoughts on the way jason todd was brought back here i mean because i've seen the arrow and what they showed with the lazarus pit which is probably the most like detailed version of any form of the Lazarus pit, including manipulation and abuse of the Lazarus pit situation. But um, yeah, they also showed that people don't come back the same way when they're dead, do they? When they're hurt, no. can be regenerated and stuff like that. But when they're not hurt and they're dead, it brings back something different, bloodlust yeah. and all that kind of stuff. So we get an explanation, obviously not right now, but we we learn how, you know, um, I mean, it's weird. It's it's weird to explain because the Superman thing would have then obviously made it so that Superman would have had to have been in this. He was in the graphic novel, only a small so part. Though. That, well, that's what I mean. What I'm saying is, is for the production of this film to take this story, it means Superman would have had to have been in this scene. And also, there is, like I say, because we're a bit out of context here, there is a bit more. Like Bruce figures out that Jason's black, uh, uh, the Red Horde. Yeah. Alfred then drops all the plates and that and he's shocked. We then get the scene with Black Mass where he beats up his henchmen for not then capturing the Red Hood. Then we get the flashback scene. I'm sure that's what happens. Yeah. No, we get the we get the Red Hood. We get the Red Hood trying to with the red dot sight or with the bazooka or whatever aimed at waving. Black Mass. <laughs> waving at him, letting him know, Oh yeah, hey, I'm here. Oh, that's me, by the way. And then I believe after that is where we start to then delve into the past, because obviously that's where Bruce obviously goes on to, well, he digs up Jason Todd, doesn't he? Oh, yeah, he digs up the body first and then meets Ray Shuggle after. Realises there's no way that Jason Todd could be eight in that condition. Like, his body would have been heavily rotted after five years. And he clearly realises that he buried, obviously, a, 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 a dummy or a mannequin or whatever, you know, made of some kind of other um like material or whatever yeah it was basically basically um just as you say it was just a dummy or um, cleaned up and put in a coffin to make it look like it's jason todd very um very live actions very dark and something you would have seen in live action don't you think that man digging up a body though digging up and digging up a dead oh, body yeah no, pretty messed it's, up it's not it's not exactly what you think is it it's not exactly what you think that a batman would be doing like it's quite dark to be honest like any any thought of that is quite dark if i'm honest it was it, and it is it's not it's very unbat like so it's, uh, it's like asking batman would you dig up the parents grave batman would be like absolutely not i mean it's weird that you've even mentioned that because at that point there you would even start questioning wouldn't you like is anything real you know what i mean yeah he's not been dead for five minutes he's been dead for five years for bruce not to have known what he buried in that in that pit or in that grave it must be a concern to batman you know what i mean it must be a concern to bruce but yeah this is where we start getting into the nitty-gritty stuff isn't it where things get really batman, good batman goes to obviously uh the racial ghoul what's it called uh Na nando parbot yeah i think that's i never really said what the place was called but yeah i would, probably would say that's where it, where it is they never really said where though officially and uh, this is where he meets Ray Shuggle. And I like the design for Ray Shuggle. It's very similar to the animated series, wouldn't you think? Well, there actually is a scene, isn't there, between the Joker and the Black Mask that just takes place briefly, where Joker overpowers the Black Mask, takes the weapon and off one of his henchmen and shoots all the henchmen. This is after he had a bag of crisps, by the way. <laughs> yeah, he's just sitting there eating a bag of chips. <laughs> it, says, it just says chips, obviously crisps for Americans, yeah? It just says chips on the thing. <laughs> He just sits there casually eating them, listening to the black mass talking crap. These are two clearly f like two freaks sitting in a room talking to each other. Like only in Gotham City will you get this crap. There's a scene um, before we get to that bit. There's a funny bit where um, um, Black Mask says, "I'm being fo I'm being forced to um, making a uh, making a negotiation with a madman," and his assistant says, "That doesn't sound good, sir." And Black Mask says, "No." It's going to be a nightmare. <laughs> but it's the drink, isn't it? He eats the crisps to <clears throat> eat crisps, gets a dry throat, and then asks for a drink of water or a drink. Yeah. 
And then he uses the glasses, doesn't he, to attack the henchman, take the gun off him, shoot all the other henchmen, then leaves Black Mask and the woman. Like, but like, obviously makes it clear that he's taken over or whatever. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Does he actually shoot the Black Mask in the end? No, 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 he doesn't. No, he doesn't shoot him. He just says to him, I'm going to need something to wear and a very big truck and some guys. Yeah, Starts screaming, don't it? Starts screaming with laughter and obviously... It yeah, costs- and he says, not your guys, because your guys are kind of dead, you know? <laughs> That's when we get a look at Rachel Gould's house or mansion that is built on top of, like, one standalone mountain. But, yeah. like, you know, like it's, it's less of a mountain and more like, you know, a, 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 it's more like a, a block of, like, high-rise flats, but the whole block is just one block of concrete. And on top of it, you've just got one house. What a waste. You know what I mean? What I know. Waste. There's just one bit before we get into this, and there's one little clue. I don't know if you observed this, but on Joker's um, prison uniform, he's got a number, 1940. Now, that probably doesn't mean much to anyone, but 1940 is actually the date slash year that the Joker first debuted in the Batman comics. I thought that was a very cool little Easter egg they threw in there. Nice. At the origin, yeah. 1940. 1940, that's when the Joker debuted in the Batman comics. So I thought that was a very little subtle way they did that. So yeah, we get to this scene where, like Rex pointed out, this massive, I don't know what you'd call it, not flats, but just this mountain. And he goes to meet Ray Shogul. This was really good. Because why were they armed? They're not they're not killers. They're assa- they're not killers with guns. They're assassins, aren't they? They they use blades and like, you know, quiet techniques and sneaky, stealthy sort of things, don't they? Like the League of Assassins. But where did this gun thing come in that they're all henchmen that use like they're like James Bond henchmen now? I don't know. Like Bond villain henchmen now, all dressed in like uh suits, like military suits with like, you know, guns and machine gun machine guns and pistols. Like yeah. when when was the League of Assassins those guys? I thought they were all, you know, live by the sword, die by the sword types of guys with special abilities and, you know, throwing stars and stuff like that. But whatever. <laughs> it did feel like a bit like a James Bond kind of moment here. Oh, you know, the way the guards. About Rachel Gould as well was ridiculous. It's like, hold on a second, wait, what? Rachel Gould, the King's Head or whatever he's called. Like, he I don't, I don't think so. Yeah, me. I don't think so. I don't think he's taking out Rachel Gould that quickly. That there would have at least been some kind of fight. It's almost like Rachel Gould at that point there is petrified of Batman. Yeah, he kind of is more or less. Uh, he comes across as like a Lex Luthor in this scene, where it's like, hold on, no, Rachel Gould's got special combat abilities and stuff. Like, what's going on here? Unless they just retcon that for other parts of Rachel Gould, but and this is just a different part of Rachel Gould. But I just get the feeling like. This whole scene portrayed Rachel Gould as somebody who's incapable of dealing with a problem, even though we've seen him be portrayed as in the Batman universe as well, as one of the most dangerous villains that have ever existed. Right. Yeah, he did kind of feel like Lex Luthor a little bit. I know he's not supposed to be. Powerless. But... Powerless. And like, what you had to, you, Rachel Gould had to go and get help from the Joker. What? Yeah, see, that just makes no sense. You're not, you're not Max Shrek. You know what I mean? Like, you're not Max Shrek and one of these randomly created characters. Um, you know, I, I can't think of any out of the series or Arrow series, but you know what I'm on about, these randomly non-powerful evil characters. Like, Rachel Ghoul, I expected at least a Damien Dark level of ability from him to be able to fight with Batman. He just gets taken out and then calls off his guard. I think it's because he's obviously supposed to know that Batman's not there to hurt him. It's more of a, we need That's to have right. a talk. Yeah. Well... The only well, Rachel Gould's got no special powers. He's he's very um, what's the word? He, he's very highly skilled fighter because you know a guy who claims to have been around for over six hundred years, you know he yeah. must know all different styles of fighting. So he's more of a fighter than like, and a it's the invincibility, or... isn't it? You can hurt him, but he won't die because obviously until you it's basically the Highlander effect. Unless you cut off his head. He's probably not going to die even if you stab him five or six times because he's just going to go to the Lazarus pit and heal. Yeah, of course. And plus plus the effects of the Lazarus pit, it can last for days or even months. You've got to remember that apart from being dead, Rachel Gould could probably be placed into the Lazarus pit in any state apart from dead and he would re-heal because he's used to the Lazarus pit by now because he's the one who obviously discovered it, all that kind of stuff. So 
Yeah, he knows how he knows how the Lazarus pit works. Years of using the Lazarus pit, you would become. I'm not going to say immune to the effects of the Lazarus pit. I'm just going to say he probably wouldn't have the same side effects now that he would have had maybe 250 years ago. No, because his body's more used to it, and plus he's adapted to it, so he knows how the pit. Knows work. how far he can take it. As long as he's not dead, he can go in the pit anytime he wants. So he either gets old. But then it's clever that he lets himself, because I kept thinking that as well, why does he keep letting himself get older and then rejuvenating himself? It's because of the side effects of the Lazarus pit, obviously. You have to actually be in a critical state of near death to that for the Lazarus pit to heal you back to a young state rather than actually being not in a state of that. So if you go in there when you're, say, just, you know, out of scratch and, you know, like Boba Fett style, you get a few depletion, you get a little depletion of your energy in that and you go in the Lazarus pit it might have an adverse effect because of the blood loss, yeah? You can't go in it while you're dead. But I also would assume then you can't go in it while you are healthy as well because if you go in it while you're healthy, it could change your mind and your thinking. You know what I mean? No, of course. Definitely, I agree. It's got to be so, a consequence of the Lazarus pit. Like, whatever the Lazarus pit is, there's got to be a consequence. Like, you're not looking at Rachel Gould being a 20-year-old man, are you? You're looking at Rachel Gould being an, he's quite an old man in this. Well he's, well, he's not old. He's he's pretty much ancient. <laughs> no, but I mean, even like with the rejuvenation that he uses, he still looks like a 50, 60 year old man in this. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like gray hair, gray size to his hair, stuff like that. He's clearly an older man. He's clearly older than Batman or Bruce Wayne or whatever. You know well, what I mean? Like, we know that his daughter's the same age. Or... Talia, well, I'd say Talia, who's actually in this movie, although she doesn't actually speak. Talia, I would say she's at least got to be 300 years old at least her, her body looks 30 35 you yeah. know what I mean? she at least be a 300 like she's obviously half of Rachel Gould's age he obviously had her down the line at some point but nonetheless yeah. obviously like I say it's more to do with the fact that we get the look into what the Lazarus pit is what Rachel Gould tried to do for Jason Todd because obviously he blamed himself for being the reason why Jason Todd was killed by the uh, the Joker and he tried to bring him back and, you know, it obviously backfired. Obviously, this is obviously Rachel Gore telling us as the audience he didn't have any knowledge of what the Lazarus Pit would do to somebody who was already dead. Yeah. Now, this scene here, and I really want to hear your thoughts about this. This scene here where he explains about why he hired the Joker, to me, just felt a bit... I don't know, really. I mean, it just felt a bit cowardly. weird. Cowardly. I just said it. I said it before. This, this, this whole thing. It's so weird and cowardly. Potentially to weaken Rachel Gould because of what we knew from the 2008 or whatever it was, the Batman Begins movie, 2004, and then the 2008 movie with the with that with Rachel Gould's character. We obviously been built up to believe that Rachel Gould was a very, very dangerous character. And I think almost like they wanted to lower Rachel Gould to below the Joker. As in, yes, Rachel Gould's a dangerous character, but he has to then go to characters like the Joker and get them to help him out. If you know what I mean, like, yeah, that's all I can think of because it weakened Rachel Gould for me. Like, why would Rachel Gould, the leader of the League Assassins, ever need the Joker to help him? Even mm. by thinking of the League of Assassins, Joker would always be a anti league of assassins type of character if you ask me their thinking is all controlled and even though it you know the bomb detonation in batman begins came across as a bit of a you know questionable thing that like, you destroy my world i'll destroy your sort of thing but at the same time um the league of assassins was always portrayed for me as more stable than what joker's group of people were joker seems to just act on pure violence and insanity whereas um, the League of Assassins, it was more to do with money and gaining and power and stuff like that. Yeah. I mean, for me, Rachel Gould going to the Joker is like the equivalent of making the deal with the devil. <laughs> yeah, it's basically how how weakened have you had to have got or how outmatched is Rachel Gould in this circumstance for him to ever need to go and get the help of the Joker? Especially, like I say, Deathstroke, multiple different characters in the DC universe that Rachel Gould could have just used as a, as a hired gun. How desperate must have Rachel Gould have been to have got the Joker? Exactly. I mean, you know, it just, it, I don't know, Joker and Rachel Gould on paper just doesn't seem like it works. 
it doesn't. Rachel Ghoul, Black Mask, and Joker being the three antagonists in this film, it almost feels like we have to look at them as all separate villains, even though obviously they don't all talk to each other. We don't get a scene with them all in it, but they all, yeah. in some way, they are all linked to each other in this film. It's weird to think that they are completely standalone characters. It basically builds from Black Mask. What is he capable of? No, he's not the threat. Oh, but don't forget there's Rachel Gould in the background of this. And then with Rachel Gould being in the background, then like, yeah, but the big, big, big bad is definitely the Joker. Oh, and then, of course, you've also got the Red Hood, who isn't a good guy in this. So it's a bit weird how they structured this. Like, they could have got away with all of this just having Batman, Red Hood and Joker. I feel well, like pretty much is centered around them, but you know, Rachel Gore and and Black Mask, not so much Rachel Gore, but Black Mask's role in this film just felt a bit out of place. Just like, well, don't really need Rachel you. Gore's did as well. I think I think Rachel Gore's did. I think Black Mask should have been used as the guy who hired the Joker. Like I'm this guy. Yeah, that would have made more sense. I'm he's this a gangster. guy who's crazy, and I've had to take limits because of the red hood i've had to which is technically what happens in this film it's the yeah. black mask who lets out joker in this but it's all linked then to the previous why it would have made more sense if in the original terms black mask was the one who went to joker joker then killed jason todd jason todd then resurrected through rachel Ghoul. that's the only reason why rachel Ghoul is in this film is because of the resurrection but then i feel like maybe then Rachel Gould should have been in the Black Mass role of this film where he was the guy who was leading all the underground gangsters and all that and he was the person in control of Gotham at the time thus then the Red Hood comes in the Red Hood then starts taking on Rachel Gould and he then goes back to the person who he feels sorts out these problems which is of course the Joker and then we get this scenario I feel like that would have made more sense than having the Red Basically, Black Mask is just an afterthought in this, thus then making Rachel Ghoul key, but still a bit of an afterthought at the same time. Yeah, absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more, you know, regarding Black Mask's role. And speaking of Black Mask, we see Black Mask gets abducted by the Joker, and we see him and his gang and his, I think, was it his assistant or something? Uh, yeah. They get um, placed in a truck and he starts soaking them in petrol. Even though he's surrounded, Joker's surrounded by the whole Gotham City Police Please. Department. I know. I mean, that was quite horrific. I mean, obviously it didn't, nothing happened, but just the fact that he soaked them all in petrol and was about to set them on fire. I just don't feel like the Gotham City Police Department have been portrayed with these Batman epics of shoot i feel like they would be shoot first ask questions later on like i don't feel like the joker or any character in the dc universe that's not a good character in fact even batman i don't feel any of the characters could just be standing on top of a building or a top of a of a uh they'd shoot at batman so why the hell did they not shoot at the joker what because he's got black mask and his bad guys tied up well you can all die you know what i mean it's, why would yeah, I know. the police department have in any way have stalled in that position there like I know that it's starting to become a little bit of a plot hole where we're picking holes in it, but that's because obviously once you do enjoy something like this, that you have no way of going back and being able to look at it. You can look at it in the most openly positive way, but I actually, you know, I'm not stupid. I could see straight through that scene there of this is just to get Red Hood and Joker in a scene together. Yeah. Apart from well, that, bound I, to get that eventually. why would anyone have cared about Black Mask and his group of villains? No one would. <laughs> I mean, the way Joker stands on the top of the truck where he's just about to set them on fire, it's almost like he feels like he's on centre stage, like he's in a theatre somewhere and got all like, the helicopter spotlight, flashlight and everything going on. I think Joker actually treats it like he's on stage performing a show. I think with knowing the recent Joker and that part of it, with him being a comedian, mm. it, this part of the Joker makes sense, even though this is obviously not even canon to that Joker. But that no. part of the Joker needing to be, and it's always been going on since the Jack Nicholson Joker, even since probably the Cesar Romero Joker, he needs to be the centre of attention. He needs to be the person who everyone looks at. And it's almost like it's very sadistic ways of hurting other people, but to almost entertain what he thinks is entertainment. That's what yes. the Joker's always come across as from day one. Whereas maybe over the years, especially the Heath Ledger Joker, it was more just 
I'm just going to do some crazy, incredibly crazy stuff to just entertain <laughs> myself. Like, especially the, I can't even think of his name, Jared Leto version. Yeah. Of, that just felt like chaos for the sake of chaos. Whereas, yeah, this Joker still has that element of almost like he wants to, he, or he feels in his mind like he's part of some kind of TV show or, you know, to be centre stage, like, finally, I've got the spotlight on me. And it is literally a scene with the spotlight on him, the spotlight from the helicopter on him. And he just starts to act up more, doesn't he? It's more, 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 until he obviously does the... And remember that they're showing you as well that part of the Joker's downfall has always been that part of it, where he has to do the, look, everybody, look at me. I am the Joker. Then Batman comes and stops him. And then he's yeah, sitting there. That's always been the downside. Why are you always here? You know what I mean? Well, you took 20 minutes to explode the bomb. Why do you think, what do you think he's going to have done? It's almost like, like I say, the whole, and I'm going to say this again, who are you without me? There you go. Like, there's part of that which is like, well, I could have exploded the bus with 25 kids on its trip, but what's the point? I, I need you to be here. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like part of the Joker seems stupid, but it's almost, it's the insanity taking over, isn't it? No, Joker's attitude is pretty much, well, none of this is possible without you. Otherwise, if you're not here, what's the point? Exactly. It is exactly that. It's the... Like I say, who am I without you or who are you without you me? Now, the whole who am I without you, vice versa, gets played quite a lot later on in this scene, which we'll get to in a moment. So we see Joker and Red Hood finally meet each other face to face. Red Hood drops a little hint about, you know, what happened to him in the past. And then what we get next here is quite possibly the most darkest emotional moment of the entire Under the Red Hood movie. What we got was Joker set the car on fire, the truck on fire. Batman then comes in his, um, uh, what's it called? The Batwing. Yeah. yeah. He puts out the fire with some extinguisher stuff that's conveniently part of the plot. Um, then Joker spots the Red Hood up above him. The Red Hood then chases the Joker away. Or that might have happened in the same time. Yeah, that did happen at the same time. Um, Red Hood and Joker then go into a, a pursuit. Red Hood catches Joker, doesn't he? And then he um, he then basically does what you were about to explain then. The, the scene turns quite dark, doesn't it? We also get a flashback somewhere in this as well of where, um, or maybe just after the scene, we get a flashback, don't we, of where Batman actually meets Jason Todd after the scene with the Joker and Red Hood, but it, it's still relevant to this scene. Yeah, there's a scene where Batman goes to the alleyway and this is the first time he meets Jason Todd as a kid where Jason Todd pretty much dismantled the wheels of the Batmobile and uh, we see Red Hood appears as memories, huh? That's where Jason has the situation with the Joker, doesn't he? He obviously captures the Joker, ties him up, takes him to some place and then we get the reveal, like you said, of the subtle hint of that we've met before because of the crowbar yeah, that would, that, yeah. with the darkness just explain this scene between the red hood with the crowbar like the reversal of the original yeah so this was brilliant because we saw at the beginning of this movie which was obviously five years earlier joker beat the tar out of jason todd with the crowbar and now it's almost like the shoes on the other foot now red hood is doing exactly what the joker did to him i think you know, this was probably the only moment that I can remember where you rooted for the Red Hood to basically put the hurt on the Joker. I mean, you're not really supposed to root for the Red Hood, but very similar to Phantasm and the Joker in Mask, in Mask of the Phantasm, wasn't it? Yeah, very similar to that. It's the lesser of the two evils. Someone, once again, someone's doing something bad, but it's for the, like, for actually a good reason or yes. someone doing something good that is for a bad reason, like the Mask of the Phantasm was, um, you know, taking out bad guys, but you're doing it, like, in the wrong way. Your dad was still a crook, etc. You know what I mean? Like, they kind of things. But in this, it's more of, yes, we know you want revenge, but you're actually doing it in the wrong way. But when you look at the Joker versus the Red Hood, it's like, hmm, yeah, this is not Batman. This is the lesser of two evils. I'm going to actually stand by Jason and his actions in this. I wouldn't be surprised if he kills him. And we wouldn't blame him if he did. Wouldn't blame him. You wouldn't blame him if he killed him. And like I said, it's the attempt as well, isn't it? Like, think about it. 
it's also you know that 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 you have to look at it even if he just tries to kill the Joker by beating him and then Batman stops him at some point, like you wouldn't blame the Red Hood for doing that because of what we've seen in the original scene. But this scene really progresses, doesn't it? Because obviously it really escalates here to uh, to absorb this the fact that the difference between the Red Hood and Batman is Batman might beat up the Joker, but he would never take it to the point where he would beat him nearly to death. No, like this point. And that's where you get the subtle hint of why Batman would then thus go after the Red Hood either way. Absolutely. Now, this next scene that carries on from that, we see Batman and the Red Hood finally meet each other. And this was actually a really good fight scene because, to me, this feels like just the dad beating the crap out of his ungrateful son. <laughs> that's how it seems like. No, no, more than that, deeper stepdad that's raised child from when he was young yeah like finally getting a chance to just just knock the crap out of the cheeky boy cheeky man that he's raised you know mm. what i mean years down the line like because a father would still have some remorse like batman doesn't seem to have much remorse here. he just seems to be regretful about his decisions it's very conflicting for batman i will say that one of the things that i hated in this scene was the iron man style uh mask that the red hood wears i really wanted that to actually be like a hood that was connected to the actual outfit i knew it was obviously made of something more sturdy than what the joker was wearing as the red hood but well, you know the red the, hood's mask it's more like i mean depending on what version you go with red hood not carrying the joker's one because that's more the retro red hood sort of look but the red hood mask that jason todd wears is kind of like a helmet almost it's, a helmet isn't it it's like a biker, it's like a biker helmet yeah and actually Power Ranger you know, or Iron Man where it clicks up at the back and opens at the back and then he takes it off I hated that I thought it should have opened from the front like the later Iron Man must do and then he took it off and it's connected to his actual body but then he can actually release it he just took it off and it fell off didn't he and I was like yeah. that's less of a hood and more of a of a of a of a mask itself or you know like you say a, um, a helmet yeah it was like a motorcycle helmet and speaking of motorcycle helmet dark knight rises pay a little homage to the red hood where bane uh drove out of the bank on the motorcycle and he wore the same sort of attire that the red hood in the movie wore this uh, like gray biker jacket with a red helmet go back to that scene you'll you'll see what i mean they actually pay homage to the red hood jason todd character with with that look but yeah this was an annoying part you know the mask just looked more very plastic didn't it the fight scene was great the fight scene was the fight scene was great oh the fight scene was excellent one bit i did like was when jason todd revealed himself and batman just standing there like jason you see that fun that lightning flash just for that split second if you pause it it flashes lightning and you see jason todd at the beginning of the movie, just standing there all beaten and bruised. You see the sort of hint. Mm. Like, when you see Nightwing earlier on in the program, Nightwing's black and blue. There's no grey yes. to Nightwing. When you look at Jason, take away the jacket and the red hood, he is just a Robin version of Batman, all grey, black mask. You know what I mean? Like, look at his suit. Like, you might not have even taken any notice, really, of that. When you look at his suit, it's just a... Like, especially when he... Batman burns the jacket. Don't ever think that I didn't spot. Why does he burn the jacket? What What are we looking at? We are looking at Batman versus what should have been Batman. Yes. Jason Todd is more than Dick Grayson. And I'm sorry, I this is where this scene shows this. Look at them when they go and fight in the bathroom. It's Batman fighting Batman. They look the same, grey, black, nothing different. No red, no light blue, no nothing. This is Batman versus Batman. What Black you are seeing, like I said earlier on, Jason Todd in Bruce Wayne's mind was supposed to have been Batman, not just Robin. He was supposed to have been the one that elevated from being Robin, the boy wonder, into then becoming the next Batman. Look at look at the what they're showing you in this scene. All black, black mask, great outfit, black outlining. He's Batman. Take off Batman's That's... cape and helmet, a cape and mask, and put it onto jason todd at the end of this scene where he's all in gray he's batman it's basically anti-batman it's it, this is literally what you're seeing here is 
the creation of what happens when your protege turns against you. Yes. Because of the blood loss, because of all that stuff. And it's even explained here a little bit like Jason doesn't hate Batman. He doesn't hate Bruce. Yeah. But, you know, part of me is basically part of you. It's the same Joker effect, but in a different, more personal way. Like I say, there's more to this. Look at the way that Jason, his outfit is at the end of this scene. Black trim with a grey outfit. He's Batman. He's basically what Bruce wanted to become Batman. And every part of him has become Batman apart from the bloodlust part of it. Like, you know, you look at this and you think almost like it's like a mirror effect for Batman. Almost like yeah. without the Lazarus pit and without the Joker killing him, you would have become me. Look at it. Look at what you see in here. There's no... There's nothing else to this Jason Todd character at the end apart from this was supposed to have been Batman. That's how I see this anyway. Like the evilness has obviously taken him over, but visually what you're looking at here is Batman versus Batman. More or less, yeah. They look the same. All you've got to do is take the eye mask off Jason, take Batman's mask off, put the mask on Jason, and it, it's the same look. Like, go back honestly and look, apart from the fact that Batman's got black boots and then a whole outfit of grey and then the trunks are black, it's still a, the same amount of black and grey mixed together. Trust me when I say what you are supposed to be looking at here is the two forms of what was supposed to have been Batman. This was never supposed to have been Batman versus the Red Hood, Batman versus, this is supposed to be Batman versus Batman because this guy was supposed to have been Batman everything about this says that to me absolutely I couldn't agree more absolutely spot on character goes from being Robin to the Red Hood to yeah some form of like an anti-Batman but still Batman in the whole of this movie you are seeing at the end of this movie what he would have been if he would have become Batman also one thing I've always noticed with fights in DC movies, especially in the bathroom, someone's always going to get their head smashed with, with a sink. <laughs> or the toilet. Yeah, you know I mean, like, or the toilet. Yeah. You know, always, that scene was deliberately designed. Also, where the hell was the door for that bathroom? Was that bathroom just contained within itself? You know what I mean? Like, that didn't make any like, sense. Door. Where was the door? I know Joker's sitting on the toilet, which is in a different place later. <laughs> or, yeah, you know, I, I, I'm literally watching this scene in the background now. But yeah, yeah, just even more now, looking at the scene now, in front of my eyes, just look at what Jason Todd is wearing. If you take, honestly, if you take off the Batman cape and mask and put it onto him, Joker would be confused and he'd, be, he'd think he'd be talking to Batman. Yeah, he would be. Same height, same stance, even Jason's got bigger in the muscles in his body. He's clearly no longer a kid. Trust me, when you're looking at this scene, it's spooky. It's very, very, very spooky now. I'm watching this back as I've just spoke about it now to even give more things. I was 100% right. What you are looking at in this scene right now is Batman versus Batman. Yeah, pretty, pretty much. Outfit, design, future trajectory. Like I said earlier on, if Joker hadn't have fucked up the timeline here, I'm almost certain that Jason Todd is as close to what a perfect version of good and evil could be, which would be Batman. Absolutely. Two characters around and say, what happens if Bruce dies? Jason then goes on to become Batman, doesn't he? Yeah, he would. And this is what we're seeing in this scene here. Now, this scene coming up here, which, again, another one of those dark emotional scenes, is Jason more or less pleads to Batman why is the Joker still alive? Why haven't you killed him yet? And there's a really good line here. Batman says that I can't because there's not a day that doesn't go by that I don't want to just torture him and eventually end him. And Joker just bees an absolute dick and says, oh, so you do think about me. <laughs> I just love the back and forth exchange because... You know, Jason Todd did make some good points. He he said that this isn't about what he did to um, um, Barbara Gordon. This isn't about what happened to Den. I'm just talking about him and him only. You know, I, I thought, uh, well, you know, Jason has been horrible throughout this movie, but he does bring up some good points. Why 
hasn't Batman killed the Joker? And then it goes back to what you said before. Who am I about you sort of thing? I thought yeah. this was very it's, well done. It's definitely that. Like, you know, it's the moment where obviously like Batman at least tries to even explain to Jason, you will never have the connection to the Joker that I've got. I, you know, if you can understand the reason why I didn't kill him is because of that connection. Your, obviously, your connection with him is different. It's a completely whole different thing. He didn't take away something from you and then you're left to live with that. He took away you, basically. Obviously, this doesn't get explained in the thing, but this is basically how you have to break down what Batman or Bruce is saying to Jason. Definitely. Like, it's almost like, you know, we, we, we are both affected by the same guy, but if you could understand why I didn't kill him and why I haven't killed him, it's you know you would understand that the world would be a better place but obviously it's it's part of the whole blood loss thing you have to accept that these are looking at it from different perspectives the whole me without you thing is batman's thing whereas jason doesn't seem to understand that point of it that like you wouldn't be as powerful as you are now and as handy and as you know just insane clearly as you are without him doing what he did to you and also batman explains that if he kills the joker then he won't stop there yeah, exactly. When when you break down, when you break it down, this Jason Todd character, the Joker basically created him. More or less, yeah. So and like at argue. the end of the day, both of them have got the link. Where technically both of them have this, the person that we are now was created by the Joker, but there's also part of, obviously, Jason that was created by Bruce. So it's yes. a bit of a weird sort of hybrid these, and you know, I'm actually going to go back on what I said before. These three characters are actually linked together if you look at it that way. They are oh. sort of in the same thing. And like I said, once again, that leads to me saying the same thing that I said before. This is Batman versus Batman and the Joker's involved. Like basically, Joker inadvertently, not even knowing what he was doing by killing Batman's sidekick, finally took away the one character that should have actually become Batman had Joker actually killed Batman. Yes, absolutely. Very, 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 very thing. So we get a really good scene here where Jason tosses Batman the gun and gives him an ultimatum. Kill the Joker. And uh, Batman throws the gun in and just re flat out refuses. And then Jason starts just more or less getting in a, a manic state. Says, you have to decide now. Who's it, is it, who's it going to be? And then... Um, Jason like picks up the gun and we see um Batman throws a battering at it and that causes um the, the gun to go off. I thought this was one of those moments where you are really on the edge of your seat, you're like you're thinking, what the hell's going to happen here, you know? And of course you see all the explosives there as well, which is kind of a play on what happened to Jason earlier in the movie at the beginning. But what was your thoughts on this uh this crazy exchange with the gun? I mean, it was a bit convenient. I will say that Batman convenience, how he managed to disarm the situation. But at the same time, it was played pretty well, to be honest. It was yeah, like, it was. like I said, once again, the blood loss cannot be controlled. And Jason obviously really knew deep down he probably should have walked away from the situation and, you know, dealt with the situation how it was. But all that, it was, for me, it was kind of designed to show the difference between the three people that are in that room. Batman would not allow any sort of damage unless it is completely and utterly necessary. Jason is willing to kill all three people in the room just because he wants to get what he wants to get. Whereas yeah. the Joker just doesn't care full stop <laughs> about what damage he does. Like you can tell Jason isn't doing it because he doesn't care. He's doing it because he has to do it in his own mind. Whereas Joker's just wild and reckless and doesn't care what collateral damage happens. And of course, Batman is no no for any sort of damage like that, even though, you know, we've seen the sort of damage that Batman has caused in some of these films and situations. It was played very, very well, very clever. Like I said, cartoon wise, it was a bit corny. I don't think they would have ever done it like that in the live action film. It would have actually been maybe Batman would have taken a bullet you know what I mean? Like, yeah, you would have definitely. But um, I think they did it well. They played they, they played this pretty well. And like I say, at the end of the day, it, it for me more as, as a person who watches these things with an open mind towards what these comic book worlds are, 
like I said, it did it it left you with that lasting vibe of separating the three characters completely. Jason didn't do a good thing, but he was doing it in his own mind for a good reason. And that's when you've got to look at it, how the three people balance up. Joker's doing it just bad because he's just a bad person. Jason's bloodlust is taken over and he's doing bad for what he believes is good reasons. And Batman's doing a lot of bad for his good reasons as well, but at the same time, he's doing a lot of good as well. Yeah. And Joker absolutely just loses it. Says, "No, this is great. I get. I finally get what I want. Yes, we all go out tonight." I just thought, "Oh my god!" Like he says, goes back to what you said before. Joke. Joker just doesn't care what happens because you know he's the Joker. And we see, as the film starting to wind down here, we see the bomb blows up, the whole building goes down, and we see Jason's gone. Now, this is quite a very, I wouldn't say unique way, but a very mysterious way to end. Do you think Jason Todd survived? Or do you think he actually got blown to bits? I want to say, of course, in the fairness of things, I want to say that he probably survived. Mm. But you just don't know, do you? It's a little bit of like the, we didn't get the Mask of the Phantasm thing where we got the final look at him like, standing i mean we got the cut scene at the end didn't we where we sh it showed when batman first met him and he was really excited to get out into the field and do whatever doing backflips and all that kind of stuff he had to get into the the um the batmobile which obviously was a subtle hint at the opposite of what nightwing said earlier about oh you always leave without me and that you can clearly see subtle little differences but no i'm gonna say it now in my mind i i'm gonna leave it that jason's alive yeah but i I strongly believe that they were trying to suggest that Jason was dead in this. But then where was the body? That's a good point. There, was no, there was no body. No, I think, I'll probably say he's still alive. I look at it that he's more than likely still alive, yeah. Yeah, so it's left the door open for a possible return of um, Jason Todd as the Red Hood. So we see Joker's back in Arkham and we learn that Black Mask is arrested for his involvement in the Joker's escape. And then um, we get a final scene in the Batcave where Alfred offers to remove the glass case of Robin's costume, which was worn by Jason. And Bruce just says, no, this doesn't change anything. And then we get a final flashback where we see Jason Todd put on the Robin suit. And this is definitely what you said before about the differences between Dick Grayson and Jason Todd, like, you know, Dick Grayson and Bruce Wayne, their partnership's more like a partner of convenience. Like, well, we're just going to work together, but we don't have to like necessarily like each other sort of thing. With Jason Todd, you know, as I said at the beginning, that like, Jason Todd was just like really happy and, you know, absolutely excited to be Robin. And there's that little line at the end, Jason says before we uh, close this out. He says here, and I actually got a bit teary when I, um, Watch this the other day. He says, this is the best day of my life. Jason's way more like Bruce's son than yeah. what Dick Grayson. Dick Grayson seemed to have had more, like, bite in his, you know, like, Jason's unaware of what the consequences are of being Batman's sidekick. But it's, it's that plucky youngster and, you know, obviously the training that he's got because he's throwing kicks and punches. Like, this, this kid's throwing kicks kicks and punches like he is like or all of a sudden like he's a powered powered yeah. person yeah yeah. And he's ready yeah. To go. yeah he is ready to go he is just all of a ball of excitement yeah but like i said yeah with the jason and bruce vibe they and i said this a little bit earlier on their thing wasn't broken up because of um you know like a, a rivalry or a, a, a wanting to progress to the next level you know theirs was Jason was hard to control and then what happened to him happened whereas with the whole Dick Grayson thing it was more of a jealousy thing wasn't it you could clearly see that you know the Dick Grayson version of Robin had outgrown being Robin but yeah Robin within one film changes doesn't he from being the boy wonder sort of thing Batman psychic into being very jealous and trying to compete all the time with Batman whereas with Jason Todd I feel like what we get in this, and I would like to see so much more from the Jason Todd version of Robin and Batman. Like, can we get some version of a film that is based on the Batman and Robin that would, because that, that he just looks like 
regardless of how reckless he is, he just looks like they had some cool times. So can we, can we get that scene with the Riddler where he takes out the Riddler? Can we get everything that leads up to that in a 45-minute animated film, please? Yes, we'd love that. Remember, like, oh, Jason Todd took on the Riddler. And then, you know, maybe even at the end of that, we then splice in the, the scene that happens years later where he takes on those gangsters and avoids all the gunshots and all that, and that then leads to something else. And in between that, you could then sandwich in a 10, 15 minute, you know, montage of progression thing where he gets from being 10, 12, 13, 14, 15. We see little various things that he's done that could be used in the future, by the way. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And then you've got, you've got yourself a 90 minute film then, haven't you, of Jason Todd Robin with Batman. Definitely. I, I'd love to see that. So before we wrap this up, we're going to rate this movie. We're going to do our rating. Rex the Boss, what would you rate Batman Under the Red Hood? I don't think it was as good as Mask of the Phantasm. I think it's it's good in certain ways and it's better than some of the other stuff that I've seen that I'm sure we'll talk about at a later date. Yeah. I'm gonna give this I'm gonna give this an I'm gonna give this an eight point five. The reason being is because there are certain issues with the Red Hood character that I didn't like. There isn't enough backstory to what we know before so if you watch this you're going to go in there blind with this robin character and you still have to suspend your belief a lot of the nightwing stuff was completely unnecessary but that that's just me nitpicking i'm going to say 8.5 because of that because it's it's not as good as the the mask of the phantasm and i did i think we rated that nine out of ten didn't we so i'm going to give this yeah. an 8.5 just because I don't think it's quite as good as that. I mean, I could be picky and say 8.75, somewhere between 8.5 and 9. But yeah, there was more to pick for me to nitpick with this, with the whole Batman bouncing off the um, the lava, the whole Red Hood mask thing, the certain things in this that were a bit structured wrong, the fact that you needed all of these villains to be part of this. They were the negative parts of this. And I'm going to say, Overall, though, I really enjoyed what I've seen. It was definitely, definitely worth a nine in if you was to watch this standalone without knowing what the Mask of the Phantasm was. Yeah. So you know, it, it has nine qualities in it, but I'm going to stick with my 8.5 rating. What about you? Um, I'm going to give this an 8.5 as well. I mean, as I said, it's my third favourite Batman animated movie. Obviously, Mask of the Phantasm still wins by a landslide at number one. I feel. The story of Under the Red Hood was good, but I think this could have been done as maybe a two-part movie. So maybe you could have had Death in the Family as part one, where Jason Todd dies at the end. And then you could have had all of the Red Hood stuff for part two. But one thing I would have liked to have seen them do, maybe in the second movie, and I would really wish they'd done this, was what I said at the beginning. They should have had Clayface you know, just take on the form of Jason Todd in the hush gear. I, I I totally understand what you mean, as in there's elements of that that they could have used here. So I'm going to give this an 8.5. Still a great movie. Maybe not as strong as Mask of the Phantasm. But as you say, if you take away Mask of the Phantasm, if you've never seen Mask of the Phantasm and you only saw this, then yeah, this would definitely be worthy of a 9 out of 10. But if you'd seen the other stuff like we have, then yeah. I would say an 8.5, but it's still good. This was still very, very enjoyable. Overall positive, yeah, very overall positive. And yeah. if I'm honest, like me just picking those things, like I've said multiple times, it's just nitpicking. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that at all. Most people are not even going to notice. No. Some of the things that I spoke about. I mean, I'm not going to lie. You'd be out of your mind not to have noticed the the springboard off the um. Alarm. That is. That is probably the most stupidest thing that I've seen, like, like in any of these films. But I, like I said, I'll forgive the fact that that happened. Like, you know, <laughs> without the resolution, it was a suspension of belief situation. It's an animated thing. I'm sure in a live action film, you would have seen that the boots would have been burnt, heavily burnt, and his feet might have even been burnt after that. But in uh, this moment, we didn't get any of that. But yeah, I don't want to keep hopping on about that anyway. It's definitely worth an 8.5. No, no, no doubt about it. Absolutely. So we are going to wrap this up now. What was your thoughts on Batman Under the Red Hood? Did you enjoy it? Do you think this could have been two movies? And also, what was your thoughts on the way the Red Hood character was portrayed? 
do you think Jason Todd could still be alive? And if so, how do you think they could bring him back? And also, what was your thoughts on Joker's role in the, helping to indirectly create the Red Hood character? You know what to do, guys. Hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, leave your thoughts and comments down below. And we will see all of you next time for another edition of the movie review series. And Rex, great to have you here as always. And it's been a lot of fun as always taking a look at this incredible oh, Batman pleasure. movie. Absolute pleasure, guys. And I hope you enjoy this. And we will see all of you next time. Bye for now.